Okay, so I'm from the Criminology Department here at the University of Kent, um, which means that I'm primarily concerned with studying behaviour that we would in some way uh, ty typologise as being deviant. So my particular area of research lies in drug taking. That doesn't necessarily mean that I regard drug taking as a um, necessarily deviant behaviour, but that's kind of the background which I'm coming from. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is some research that I did between 2008-2009. It was a small-scale exploratory research project um, based around the psychedelic trance scene and drug-taking. Uh, I built an internet survey, um, sent the link to friends and contacts, posted it on Psytrance forum websites and so on, um, and got about 80 people filling in the, the questionnaire. And everybody who filled in the, the questionnaire on the internet was invited to get in contact if they felt, felt that they were in some way particularly connected to the psychedelic trance scene. They, they felt it was a really central part of their lives. I asked them to get in touch and maybe consider um, making themselves available for an interview. So I interviewed 20 of the, of the self-identified hardcore of the psytrance scene. Um, and also at the same time, I was living in London, I was very interested in the psychedelic trance music scene myself, so I attended a, a large number of parties, um, both official ones, put on in nightclubs by big name DJs, but also unofficial warehouse parties and outdoor parties and also music festivals to some extent. So that kind of added another layer of dimension to the research, which maybe um, we would call participant observation. Uh, and in the research, I asked people about their involvement in the psychedelic trance scene, their drug-taking behaviour, which was, of course, my primary interest, um, but also their behaviour at the different kind of parties they went to, because more of this later, but one of the things I found very interesting was this split between the official parties organised in uh, big nightclubs and the unofficial warehouse or outdoor parties. Okay, just to give you a little bit of background to the research, um, when in criminology and, and society in general, I guess, when we think about, typically in the past, when we've thought about illegal drugs, the dominant view has been that illegal drugs are not something for everybody, they're something taken by a small number of deviant people. And we've sometimes talked about these groups as subcultures. Um, so subcultures from the past would be groups like the Beats, hippies, mods, rockers, punks, to name just a few. Groups of young people who in some way come together to try to express um, dissatisfaction with mainstream culture and in its place to set up their own counterculture with their own norms and values. And within these countercultures, the way that we can identify people as belonging to them is maybe they, you know, by the way that they dress or the hairstyles that they have, um, but also the kind of music very often that they listen to and uh, the kind of drugs that they take because there's a real established link between these subcultural groupings and different kinds of drugs. So more up-to-date academic thinking about drug taking says that now drug taking is such a normal behaviour that it no longer really makes sense to talk about it being linked to these little pockets or small groups of people in society. 
If you look at the figures uh, from the British Crime Survey and various other sources, nearly half of all young people have now tried drugs. So it doesn't make sense anymore to say drug taking is countercultural, it's against the mainstream society. Instead, it makes sense to say drug taking is part of the mainstream society. And also, it's much harder to think now of subcultural groupings within society. Um, since maybe punks and goths, it, there aren't so many distinct, long-lasting groups. We still have trends and interests in dress and music and drug taking, but they come and go more quickly. And also they become much more commercialised, so it, they don't necessarily make sense as being um, underground or countercultural anymore. One suggestion is that rave music, raving, is a kind of subculture. But if it is, then it's one that changes very quickly with trends c coming and going in terms of music, dress, drugs, etc. Uh, it's very. What I'm trying to say is basically, if you, if I said to you, what's your tri typical raver? It'd be very difficult to think of some of exactly what they would look like. It could be anybody. So the aims of my study were to look at the psychedelic trance scene and ask, first of all. Um, could the psychedelic trance scene in any way be described as a modern subculture or is it something that everybody's getting involved in? And secondly, um, <clears throat> as I identified this hardcore group who really felt themselves to be part of the scene, was their behaviour different in any way to the behaviour of people who are more around the edges in terms of drug taking um, and also several other kinds of behaviours that some might class as, as deviant, which I'm not going to have time to go into. Um, okay, why Psytrance very quickly? Um, obviously, my own personal interest when I moved to London um, was, the, was the inspiration, if you like. But there were several other good reasons to choose the psychedelic trance scene for this kind of study. So firstly, I wanted to choose a scene that was globalised, something that wasn't just located to the UK. Um, I wanted to choose a scene which had at least some of the, superficially, some of the typical signs of a subculture. And psychedelic trance, uh, you could argue there are people involved, have a certain style of dress, they listen obviously to a certain kind of music, and um, the, de the de decorations and decor at these kind of nights was very uh, distinctive. Thirdly, I was very much attracted by, as I said, the official and unofficial party elements, the differences between these two sides of the scene. And finally, I wanted to choose a scene which had as wide a range of drug taking as possible. So not just something that would be confined to ecstasy or just to cocaine or amphetamines, but also to bring in ketamine, LSD, um, magic mushrooms, as many as possible. And I know that you know, there are lots of scenes that probably fit these different criteria, but I felt that psychedelic trance was one that had a lot going for it. Okay, I've got some um, pictures here. Um, I'm not going to spend too long on these because I'm kind of guessing that quite a few people here are familiar to some extent with what I'm talking about. But these were just to kind of try and show some of the sense of style uh, that I noticed. So these are some flyers, um, and you can notice obviously the use of colour um, and images and so on. Um, I've also got pictures here of various parties and festivals that I and my, my colleague Sarah, who, who um, did the research with me, attended, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so we've got SE1 London, uh, you can see the decorations and, and colours, um, Digital Hive, uh, we've got Festival in Greece here, which, which was, you know, Psytrance was very big there, maybe at the beginning of this decade, we've got some, some of the clothing, there's a certain sen sense of style amongst the clothing, M maybe even the dancing, there's a certain kind of dancing from Morocco here. Uh, Italy, uh, Boom Festival, Portugal. So again, you can see the, the decorations and so on. Um, <laughs> in <laughs> Germany here, maybe you can see a little bit the hairstyles um, and, and the decorations. Uh, Hungary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so, so to, to think very quickly about the results, because I'm aware I, I probably haven't got very much time. Um, okay, the, the number of people we had involved, it was quite a diverse sample. The age range was 21 to 33, so still quite young, but not perhaps that very young period that people might um, talk about. Uh, it was 50% male, 50% female, which is quite nice, because sometimes it can be you know, hard to get enough women um, when you 
recruit off the internet. Okay, the nationality, it was mostly... <laughs> It was mostly British, um, although a really diverse range of, of nationalities were represented, and there was also a significant number of Greeks, because Sarah, my colleague, is Greek, so when we initially started the snowballing and sending out to our friends, uh, a, a disproportionately high number of Greek people were probably included in that. Uh, there were all sorts of occupations, students, academics, unemployed, journalists, marketing executives, handy men and women, etc., etc., um, generally, it was a well-educated sample, um, but it was overwhelmingly white. Ethnicity was, uh, was, was not diverse at all. It, it was very much a white sample. And in terms of my own particular research interest, 93% of the sample identified themselves as drug takers. So for the purposes of the research, great. Um, lots of people involved in drugs, which is what I was primarily interested in studying. Um, so, it, so far, it's very hard to see any subcultural elements. There's not a particular type of person that was identifying themselves as being involved in the side trance scene. It was men, it was women, it was a relatively diverse um, age range, people from all kinds of class backgrounds, um, et cetera, et cetera. But if we turn now, for, for the rest of the talk, I really want to look at the, the hardcore uh, group um, so if we look at them a little bit more, then maybe there were some more subcultural elements. So I've got some quotes here which kind of show the themes um, of the research that I want to pick out. So first of all, people identified strongly with the scene. Psytrance really meant something to them. I'd say it's a part of my life because it's kind of helped me decide what I want to do and changed my views on a lot of things or added to my views that I had before and kind of enforced them or emphasised them. So yeah, quite a big part of my life. It's not something I'd probably say, oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. <clears throat> People also um, talked very much about a community feeling, and a lot of quotes mentioned the word family. People kept talking about a family. So this feeling of community, there are people that you know for a long time, and you'll be meeting up every weekend or every other weekend to be dancing with each other. You tend to know a certain group of people, like a hardcore of people that go to all of them, and it's like a big family kind of situation that you'll see these people, and these people will create a nice kind of atmosphere. It's the music and the people. I love the family feeling it creates, and I love the fact that random people come and hug you and talk to you. So we've got, we've got a real sense here, you know, people are identifying themselves as belonging to something, belonging to a family, belonging to a community. Um, which, it, which would be an important element of a subculture, a feeling of belonging to that group um, with a certain uh, set of identities. Okay, drug taking was a big part of it for the hardcore group, but not necessarily in a way that I'd encountered before. In my research, and, and possibly to a certain extent in my personal life as well, when I'd encountered drug taking, it seemed to be about, well, people wanting to get wasted, basically. But when I was talking to this smaller, hardcore group of, of the Psy trance scene, they were talking about drugs in a way that I hadn't come across very much before, which feeds in very much to what everybody's been talking about today at the conference, the kind of healing powers, the, the you know, not doing it because you wanted to get wasted, but doing it for other benefits as well. So people talked about it makes you kind of aware in different ways of things. It makes you aware of yourself in different ways that you haven't been before. Talking about the drugs, they make me more grateful for life and grateful for being alive and my place in the planet. So they make me more happy, basically, or more satisfied. They give meaning, actually, to my life, like spiritual meaning, like depth. And I feel, you know, acid, for me, it's like an exploration and I enjoy the feeling that I get. It's like, for me, it's like an exploration of many things. So drug taking was important, but not necessarily in that subcultural, countercultural way. People weren't... There was no evidence that people were getting involved in drug taking and psy trance because they wanted to make a, a, a revolutionary confrontational statement um, or, or not of perhaps the kind I expected, but more um, that they were concerned with self-exploration and possibly self-healing. Um, but, but also it was about much more than drugs uh, and drug taking. It was about... Uh, potentially a cultural identity. So people talked about uh, the wider shared identity of the scene. Many people in the scene are concerned about environmental problems. You have lots of vegetarians, activists as well. 
because part of the culture thing, it's connected with the nature. Paganism is very popular as a religion between the people who go to parties and also because the links with India are quite strong. I think it's about like DIY culture, do-it-yourself culture, making your own clothes, making your own food, doing your own thing. I think there's a lot of political views behind it, quite an environmental point of view, but quite an anarchistic point of view. Yeah, I'd say there's definitely a culture, no doubt about it. Um, and thinking back to the drug taking for a second, um, the evidence, and this kind of ties in with the normalization thesis, that, that drug taking isn't something abnormal anymore, it's something that's quite normal. You just do it as part of the rest of your life. It doesn't define you. It doesn't get in the way of your ordinary life. And I found evidence from people that I interviewed uh, to suggest that was the case. So for example, if I go to a party all night, then I always make sure that I have one day after that when I don't have any responsibilities. Like now I'm working with people and I'm actually taking care of people and I have to help them go to the toilet sometimes and the shower and give them medication. So now I wouldn't go to work without having slept after a party because that's not responsible to the people that I'm now responsible for. And as much as I like partying, some things are just more important. They might not be as fun. And it's a part of my everyday living without overtaking my life. So it, drug taking, it, it doesn't necessarily make sense for, from what's being said here to think of drug taking as an expression of a deviant lifestyle. It, that doesn't fit anymore with the kind of image of these um, otherwise responsible, otherwise law abiding, otherwise very self-aware uh, individuals. Okay, and I just wanted to sort of come to the end of, of what I'm going to say by thinking um, a little bit about this split between the unofficial and the official parties and what that means in terms of subculture and mainstreaming and commercialization, because this was a really fascinating part of the project for me. So they've picked these two quotes because I think they show the different aspects that I found. So um, you've got the first quote, which talks about the, the very official, commercialized, mainstream part of Psytrance. Many subgenres are getting out there. Whole industries are getting built around it, ranging from magazines, special publications, CDs, special sites, clothing, illegal paraphernalia, whatever. So it's getting more commercialized as everything that gets established. But then the second quote is from somebody who's talking about the unofficial, more underground side of the scene, saying they enjoy giving a party, they want to do something for other people, and it's not just about making profit. I mean, they can make profit, but they invest it in the next party, and it doesn't just end up in somebody's pocket. And this is what I like, that people do it for community and for each other. So I haven't got much time to go into, into the sort of details of this part of it, uh, but one of the things that we looked at in the study is a difference between the people that went to the, to the different kinds of venues. And, and what we quite quickly discovered is that the people we interviewed, the self-identifying hardcore group, um, as well as the people who, some of the people who filled in the survey who seemed to have gone to, you know, to be more involved in the scene from their answers, um, seemed to be much more likely to go to the underground events, the warehouse parties um, and the um, outdoor location parties. Whereas the people who um, went to the official parties, the hardcore group went to them as well, but so did the people on the periphery. So it's much more um, uh, a normalized or diverse group, if you like. So we analyzed the data to try to look at the, um, some of the behaviors by whether somebody was really very fully immersed inside trance or whether they were on the edges. And we looked at that. We also divided the data up by whether you went to primarily um, official parties or underground parties. So I've just, um, there, there were many, many questions, but I wanted to keep this uh, to time really, and it, it, you can't you know, hope to present everything in a short uh, talk like this. So I've just put up one graph of, of uh, one of the questions, which was drug taking by venue. So what we found, um, as you should be able to see here, is that drugs were much more likely to be taken at secret venues. Um, the secret <coughs> venues is the, is the green, and you can see that almost every drug, apart from weirdly LSD, is more likely to be taken um, in a secret venue. Um, and also that a wider variety of drugs is taken at secret venues. So some of the drugs towards the right-hand side of the graph are only taken um, at secret venues. So just to give a tantalizing glimpse of the conclusions, um, to a certain extent, elements of the Psytrance scene 
um, are part of the mainstream culture. They have been normalized, they are commercial. You can't say there's a typical person that would go to an um, official Psytrance party. But evidence suggests that a subcultural core may well exist, people who are more likely to go to the underground or secret location parties. Um, and a preliminary analysis of the data suggests that this subcultural core may be more likely to be involved in drug taking and certain other behaviours that we might classify as deviant. Thanks. <laughs>